Hello, and thanks for watching. I'm Jason Lance. I'm Senior Director of Release Engineering at Salesforce.org, and I'm really excited to talk to you today um, in the context of PyCon about how Python is powering Salesforce.org's unique open source model, and also how you might be able to use some of the Python tooling uh, that we built to build integrations with Salesforce into your own Python web application projects. Before we begin, just some quick legal disclaimers. We're gonna talk about some forward-looking things. Don't make any investment decisions based on any of this forward-looking content. Uh, only make your investment decisions based on what is currently available in the market. Now, with that out of the way, let's get into some, uh, or cover the agenda real quick. We're gonna go through some quick introductions about me, Salesforce, and salesforce.org. Then we're gonna talk about open source at salesforce.org. Then we're gonna look at the, uh, uh, main kind of Python tooling framework that we built at salesforce.org and made available as open source. And uh, then we will get into kind of the bulk of the session, which is gonna be three demos that sort of build on top of each other. In the first demo, we'll show creating a new Salesforce development project using Cumulus CI. And then in the second demo, we'll show the uh, three web applications that we built on top of Cumulus CI using Python. Those are Meteco, MetaCI, and MetaDeploy. And then in the final demo, we'll bring it all together and kind of apply it to you as a Python developer to show how you can uh, integrate a Python web application with Salesforce. And you know, why would you want to do that? Well, you know, um, there are uh, plenty of users of Salesforce, and having the ability to integrate your application uh, with Salesforce, still develop your application in Python, but build that integration for your users potentially opens up a whole new user base for you and adds a lot of value for those users that are using Salesforce. So let's start with the introductions. Who am I and why am I here? Aside from the obvious philosophical question there, um, we'll just kind of get into the context of uh, why I'm here at PyCon. Um, so I started uh, my career as a Unix administrator, quickly realized I wasn't a very good administrator and started you know, diving into open source projects and really discovered that I, I like building things. I really like prototyping things. Back in about 2003, I discovered this new Python project uh, just starting out called Plone, uh, back when it was in version one. And I started playing around in Plone, really kind of fell in love with it as a content management system. And that inspired me to want to learn Python. As somebody who didn't come from a computer science or a programming background, Python was a, a really great fit for me. It seemed you know, very elegant. The projects that were out there uh, had a, you know, just seemed really well written. Um, and so I learned a lot of what I know about programming from Python. I'm very excited to, to kind of have the opportunity to present it at, at PyCon. Then in about 2008, I made the transition from building kind of corporate web applications to uh, working for nonprofit organizations. I worked for two amazing nonprofits in uh, New York City um, during that time. And then I got the opportunity to join Salesforce.org in 2013. And this was really an opportunity, rather than working for just a single nonprofit, to maximize the impact that I can create in the world by applying my technology skills um, to benefit tens of thousands of nonprofit and now education organizations that are using Salesforce for their day-to-day -day work. My job at Salesforce.org has been focused on making DevOps easier for the Salesforce community. And I think my background in the Python, or especially with Python open source projects and, and Python CMS and, and web projects, uh, has really helped me think about DevOps and bring a different perspective of DevOps to the Salesforce community. Um, and, um, you know, I think, I think that has actually allowed me to create a lot of the things that, that we've, or that I've been able to create over that time. Now, if you haven't heard of Salesforce before, um, Salesforce is a customer relationship management solution that brings companies and customers together. It's one integrated CRM platform that, that gives all your departments, including marketing, sales, commerce, and service, a single shared view of every customer. We bring companies and customers together to deliver the personalized experiences that your customers expect by using the integrated CRM platform that we call Salesforce Customer 360. Now, what does Salesforce believe in? This is actually really personal to me and why, why I'm here. Our core values help us make Salesforce a platform for change. You'll see our core values over on the right here, trust, customer success, innovation, and equality. Those are our core values. That's the order of the ranking of our core values. And it's a lot more than just a plaque that's somewhere posted in our office. 
over the over my years here, I've seen the company uh, use these core values to guide decision making so that we can focus on doing the right thing by our customers and the right thing by the world. I work at salesforce.org and salesforce.org is a business unit inside of Salesforce. We are the social impact center of Salesforce. So we believe that the purpose of business should be to improve the state of the world. We provide access to powerful technology that empowers change makers to build a better world. We are a unique business unit dedicated to creating solutions for nonprofit, educational, and philanthropic organizations so that they can have greater impact. A really essential part of that and uh, the part of the organization that I work in in our product development team is uh, the uh, grant of either free and then additional licenses at a heavily discounted rate for nonprofit and education organizations. The, we have or, uh, nonprofit and education organizations all over the world using Salesforce, uh, using these grants. Um, for example, in the United States, most any 501c3 nonprofit organization, no matter how big or small, can get 10 free enterprise edition licenses to Salesforce. For small organizations, and actually that represents the vast majority of the nonprofits that use us, they pay us nothing. They can work within the 10 free licenses that they have. Um, and uh, I think that's an amazing benefit that, that we're providing to the world of this platform that we built for corporations and the marketing and sales needs of corporations and being able to leverage all of that investment, all of that innovation uh, to apply to this community of change makers that we service. To date, we've got over 44,000 nonprofit and education organizations around the world that are using Salesforce through salesforce.org. And we invest heavily in building products that adapt Salesforce Customer 360 to the needs of a nonprofit or of an education organization. So we flip from a customer relationship management to constituent relationship management. Now let's talk a little bit about open source at salesforce.org. And when you think about open source at salesforce.org, there's kind of three main types of open source that I want to talk about and cover today. The first is we have open source products. And I think this is where our kind of unique open source model uh, really lives. We have open source products to provide a, co a common tra uh, trusted platform for innovation in the nonprofit and education sectors. Salesforce.org, our partners and our customers build solutions on top of these products. We also have tooling that we've developed to solve our common DevOps needs and challenges that we faced in uh, our development projects on top of the Salesforce platform. And we make those tools available as open source to the entire Salesforce community. These tools are all written in Python, and then the web-based tools are using Django with, that we run out on Heroku. We'll be taking a lot, of, uh, a lot more look at this tooling today. But kind of the reason uh, for that tooling is in addition to support our products, but really where my heart is, is in supporting our community. We built this amazing, or actually the community has, has sort of spawned into an amazing uh, open source community that we kind of help uh, facilitate in whatever way we can. And the newest way that we've done that is the salesforce.org open source commons, where we host community sprints throughout the year to bring together customers, partners, and staff to build open source solutions focused on making the world a better place and making life easier for nonprofit and education organizations to fulfill their missions. The salesforce.org open source commons also helps incubate sustainable open source projects by leveraging salesforce.org's expertise, access, and tooling to benefit those projects. We'll talk about each of these in a little bit more detail. But let's dig in on open source products. So when I say that we've got a unique open source model here at salesforce.org, um, I think this uh, kind of represents it a little bit. Um, in this pyramid on the left, uh, the arrow on the left side, you can see that easier for developers is down at the bottom of this, of this pyramid, at least initially. You write some code, you put it in a GitHub repository, no docs, no packaging, don't think about anything, you just kind of push commits up into the repository. It's very easy for you to get your code out to the world. But as you'll see in the first arrow on the right, that is not easier for users. Um, that's actually going to be the hardest for users to be able to use. So if you want to get users of your application, have something more than just the field of dreams, um, but actually get people playing on it, you need to start actually focusing on building documentation, creating releases of your product, creating an installable package of your product, maybe creating some pre-configured templates that customers can start from, but then build out their own implementations. But the challenge is the overall maintenance for the, for the end user of that 
they have to continually upgrade and integrate their changes with new releases that you come out with. At the top of the pyramid here is really where we target our open source model, which is the idea of providing pre-configured, fully hosted uh, instances of our software with automatic upgrades on a regular basis. We cut in new releases of all of our products every two weeks and push upgrade those to all of our existing customers. So there's 44,000 plus um, organizations using us. And the way we're able to do that is because we have this unique combination of open source products and corporate philanthropy. The corporate philanthropy provides the platform that our open source model is based upon. And then we innovate and provide these products that we deliver out to the world. So for those small nonprofit organizations that pay us nothing, they're living in the top rung of this triangle, getting the best of both worlds, the hosting and the open source product development, the open source community around it. Now the arrow on the far right here, you can see uh, that easier for developers at scale. As you start getting more customers and, or more users of your open source uh, project, scaling the support of that is a challenge. And by having these pre-configured hosted instances that are always updated, so everybody's always running on the latest release, um, we've really been able to scale our uh, development efforts to create huge impact in the world. As far as I know, I don't think that there's another open source project in the world that really does this combination of corporate philanthropy to provide uh, hosting in an enterprise class platform of the open source projects that they're building. I think it's a really unique model and something I'm really excited to be a part of. Our open source products at salesforce.org are divided between two of our main clouds, the nonprofit cloud and the education cloud. On the nonprofit cloud, we have three open source products, the nonprofit success pack or NPSP, which provides a foundation for the data tracking needs of nonprofit organizations, things like managing uh, their relationships with uh, constituents, their households, uh, um, fundraising efforts, relationships and affiliations between people and organizations. And then uh, our newest uh, open source project is the program management module that just launched about two weeks ago. And uh, the program management module uh, builds, or provides a kind of data schema, a common data schema for nonprofit organizations to be able to track their programmatic work. For instance, for food banks, the number of meals served for um, pet rescue organizations, the number of puppies saved. Um, and then finally, Volunteers for Salesforce is an additional open source project of ours in the nonprofit cloud. And Volunteers for Salesforce uh, uh, helps thousands of nonprofit organizations around the world track and manage their volunteer efforts. On the education side, uh, like NPSP, we have the Education Data Architecture, or EDA, which provides a common framework for building education applications. There's a whole bunch of different applications that are built on top of EDA, um, both by our partners and by us. Um, EDA provides, for instance, um, objects for being able to track terms and course offerings and course enrollments um, and you know, the, the basic kind of data structure that you need in order to build any sort of solution in the education space. It's open source, it's a trusted platform in uh, the education sector, especially of those organizations that are running on Salesforce. And then we're all, we've also built the K-12 architecture kit, which extends EDA and adds additional schema elements that are important for a K-12 use case in the education context. So those are our five main open source managed package products that we make available uh, through this unique open source model combined with corporate philanthropy. Now let's talk about our open source tooling. So the main part of our open source tooling, as I mentioned earlier, is Cumulus CI, which is a Python framework for portable automation for Salesforce projects. It was built to solve the unique DevOps needs of Salesforce development projects. It's used every day by Salesforce.org's product development teams. And I don't just mean developers, I mean our QEs, our doc writers, our UX uh, people, our uh, project managers, even our partners doing implementations are, are utilizing this. It's developed in a public GitHub repository at SFDO tooling forward slash Cumulus CI. And also just in, in uh, March, something I'm really proud of, we uh, worked for a long time trying to get a, a learning module together to teach Cumulus CI and how to work with it. So if you're interested in any of the demo content today, um, I definitely recommend going out and going through this trail. Trailhead is Salesforce's free online learning system. 
Uh, so you can go learn about the Salesforce platform, but there's also tons of additional learning out there just about agile processes and things like that. Um, and it really uh, has, has just a, a ton of amazing content that's all available for free. Now, in addition to Cumulus EI, kind of the framework, we built three different web applications that are using Django and Heroku uh, that sit on top of Cumulus EI and extend the automation in a context that we call portable automation, which I'll explain a little bit more later. The first of those web applications is MetaCI, which is a custom CI app that's run on Heroku for scalable continuous integration of Salesforce projects that are using Cumulus CI. The reason that we built our own custom CI app is because the needs of Salesforce development projects are a little bit unique in comparison to most development projects where you can run your code in a virtual machine or in a Docker container. Um, our builds are actually more client APIs that are installing that are installing things into a Salesforce instance. And because of that difference, we found that uh, it really made sense to build a tailor-made CI system specifically for this use case. We still use other CI systems to build our Python projects and things like that because they're, they're plentiful. Um, but the Salesforce DevOps space was, was unique enough that it made sense to go ahead and build our own CI system. MetaDeploy is a customer-facing installer and automation tool uh, providing bring-your-own-org access to a project's Cumulus CI automation through a simple web interface. Now, when I say org here, in the Salesforce world, that's how we refer to an instance or a tenant um, in the Salesforce platform. So every customer has a, their Salesforce org, usually a production org. They have sandboxes off of that. There's other types of orgs that we'll talk about and, and show in, in today's demo. But the key thing about MetaDeploy is it's about customers being able to bring their own Salesforce instance and install our products into it, run all the automation necessary to get them installed and configured. And then the newest tool, which I'm really excited about, um, that we've been working on for uh, almost a year now, um, so therefore the, the coming soon, we've been uh, doing some kind of pilot testing of this, but uh, this tool is called Mateco, and Mateco is designed to empower Salesforce admins to contribute to open source projects through clicks, not code, without any knowledge of Cumulus CI or GitHub or Python. Um, they can just, through a simple web interface, contribute to uh, projects that are on GitHub using the skill set that they built up of interacting with sale or doing declarative configuration through Salesforce's web interface, but get the best of breed combination of that with version control based development. And we'll take a look at all of these apps uh, in our second demo. So let's talk about our open source community. In the nonprofit and education sectors, if you've ever had the had the opportunity of working uh, with any nonprofits or education organizations, you'll find that there's really an inherent desire to share. Food banks don't compete with each other. They, they, you know, a food bank in one county doesn't compete with a food bank in the next county. They just want people to be fed. Pet rescue organizations don't compete with each other. They want pets to be uh, to find good homes. But the real challenge is how to share these kind of technical solutions that are built. Uh, they have a lot of power for the organizations that make the investment in building them, but how do you share those solutions out with others in your sector? And our way of addressing that has been uh, creating what, uh, what we call the salesforce.org open source commons. And the open source commons has two main components to it. The first, as I mentioned before, is we run these open source community sprints. Now we were, there were open source community sprints in the salesforce.org world long before we had the open source commons. There's a long history going back many years. In fact, NPSP, our largest open source project with tens of thousands of users, originally started as a community created open source project that uh, we started collaborating with the community and putting real investment effort uh, behind evolving and developing out that system. So these open source community sprints are two day in person and now in the COVID-19 world virtual events. We just had our first open source community sprint. It was supposed to be an in-person event in Atlanta uh, at the beginning of uh, April, but we wound up having to cancel that and switch it to a virtual event. Our virtual event had over 100 attendees there for two days, building some really amazing solutions. And it was awesome seeing the energy that was there in the room. Uh, and, and really, I think, a testament to the passion that exists inside of our, our community. 
there are technical and non-technical projects. So people want to build solutions on top of the Salesforce platform that they can release as a package and other people can install under their instances. There's also people just creating, you know, documentation or videos or other ways to help people. Um, and really all of those ideas start as just a brainstorming in a very unconference uh, type uh, configuration where people uh, you know, kind of brainstorm and announce the ideas that they have. People that are interested kind of group up at different round tables uh, around the room or in different breakout rooms in a virtual event. And all of these projects are developed, both the technical and non-technical, using GitHub repositories out on the SFDO Community Sprints GitHub organization. Now, the second part of the Open Source Commons is this program to support community run open source projects that are sustainable. And uh, we provide the process and the infrastructure to facilitate these community run open source projects for the nonprofit and education sectors. The projects have to meet sustainability requirements to be accepted. So it's not just that somebody built something cool, it's that there's a team of people that are committed to maintaining the project, to meeting regularly, to creating releases as uh, there's new features available, reviewing pull requests in the GitHub repository. All of the projects that get accepted uh, then get moved into our GitHub organization, SFDO Community, which is the organization for official open source commons projects. Salesforce.org provides all of our tooling, MetaCI, MetaDeploy, and Meteco for those open source community projects to be able to manage the kind of packaging and the testing and all of that uh, at scale with as you know with a minimal amount of investment or involvement needed from them. So we really want to lower the bar as much as possible to community projects that uh, you know have a have a community behind them, but maybe just don't know how to do all of these things or some of these things without this tooling are really time intensive. Uh, and so we don't want that to be a barrier to sharing. And then finally, we facilitate getting a sales or getting a Salesforce ISV security review on uh, the packages that are, are that come from these projects and publish getting those uh, packages published and available to the Salesforce community. <clears throat> now we talked about this kind of unique open source model and where I see all of this is that with the open source commons and the potential to tap into this whole community of innovators, we really have this new layer on top of it a layer of exponential impact by empowering community-driven open source solutions to common and sector-specific challenges. And this goes way beyond the engineering capabilities of our team. No matter how big we grew our team to be, it could never match what our community is capable of doing if we're effective at empowering them to do it. All right, so let's shift gears and talk a little bit more technical now. And let's talk about Cumulus CI, as this is kind of the core framework, and we're going to be looking at this uh, throughout the demos today. Now, when uh, you think about DevOps for Salesforce, I really think there's kind of one primary challenge, and it's a, it's a, it's a common DevOps challenge of getting environments. Um, but the challenge in Salesforce is a little bit different than uh, most other DevOps environments in the sense that um, you can't run any of our code in a virtual machine or in a Docker image. Your Salesforce code or metadata, uh, as it's called in the Salesforce world, has to be deployed into an instance or an org of Salesforce running in the cloud. And you know, for a long time, the and, you know, Salesforce made available developer edition organiz or developer edition orgs that anybody could go out and fill up a fill out a web form, get a developer edition org. It was a persistent org. You could deploy uh, metadata into it. You could create data inside of it. It was always around. But as we know from general DevOps best practices, it's really not a good idea to have a persistent, always there uh, test environment or development environment. Better practice is to be able to create and destroy them easily. So a few years ago, Salesforce DX uh, or the Salesforce developer experience was a project launched by Salesforce and uh, created a command line interface, the Salesforce CLI, um, which the command is SFDX. We'll see that here a little bit later. And it made this whole process better by introducing this concept of scratch orgs, which are temporary Salesforce instances that you can provision and destroy via API calls. The thing about scratch orgs is they start from sort of an org shape, which is a JSON file where you define the Salesforce edition, the features, and the settings that you want to have in 
your Salesforce org. But that's not really setting up anything that's project specific. That's kind of just which bits are on in uh, the, the base Salesforce system. But Salesforce as kind of a platform for custom development, what these projects are focused on is building custom solutions on top of what Salesforce has built. Um, and to be able to do that, you really need to uh, be able to have automation that can uh, take that can build you usable scratch org environments for development and QA. And that requires installing other packages, deploying metadata into your instance, and also loading data so that when a tester goes in to get an environment from a feature branch, the environment that they get just by running the automation is actually fully ready for them to start testing. And that's really the core of, of the challenge that Cumulus EI was built uh, to provide a framework for orchestrating all of those changes on a project by project basis in a highly configurable way. So let's uh, take a quick look at the structure of Cumulus CI and sort of how, how it's set up. Um, there are four main parts to Cumulus CI, which is a Python package that we build. It's available on PyPy. You can install it with pip install Cumulus CI. And the first component of Cumulus CI is the Cumulus CI.yaml file. Cumulus CI is a very configuration-driven framework, and all of the configuration gets mapped through this Cumulus CI.yaml file. The base Cumulus CI.yaml file makes up what we call the global configuration and has all of the best practice defaults that we find helpful across most every project. Then the second component is Cumulus CI's keychain, which is its credential store. It stores credentials, OAuth connections to existing uh, to persistent Salesforce orgs and also has the ability to interact with uh, Salesforce DX to spin up scratch orgs and delete scratch orgs. And then also has uh, the ability to uh, store third-party service credentials to things like the GitHub API that you might need when you're writing your automation for your projects. The third part of Cumulus CI is tasks. And really tasks are kind of the bulk of everything that Cumulus CI does. We've got a bunch of different tasks you can see listed here for all sorts of different things that we find helpful throughout the development process. And tasks are the basic unit of work in uh, Cumulus CI's automation. And then on top of tasks are flows. Flows are sequences that ultimately reduce down to tasks. Flows can call other flows, but ultimately that redu reduces down to a sequential list of, of tasks. And Cumulus CI ships with a number of flows out of the box by default that we find helpful in almost any Salesforce development project. So flows like the dev org flow and the QA org flow, which respectively get you a fully configured scratch org ready to, uh, to start doing development work or a fully configured scratch org ready to start doing QA work. There's also flows for testing kind of the managed version. If you're building a managed package, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, to kind of build the, the kind of release side, what the customer environment is going to look like. There's some flows that we provide for uh, running in CI systems like CI feature, which is a flow for testing feature branches. Um, and then also flows for automating release management uh, processes to create a new beta release or a new production release of a package. Now, as a configuration driven system, all of these tasks in Cumulus CI are defined in, in the Cumulus CI.yaml file. In the, in the global uh, configuration file. So here's an example of what the deploy task looks like for deploying metadata. And you can see that it's uh, defaulted the task specific option path to the directory called SRC. Um, all of these tasks can define their own custom task options. So we try to make it a very declarative driven system. Most people, can do, most people that are using Cumulus CI don't know anything about Python. Um, but they can do a ton of customization of how Cumulus CI works just by modifying these uh, YAML or the, the YAML syntax. The other thing that's important about the options in this YAML syntax is we like to bake all of the options into the project's configuration. So you're not having to remember a whole bunch of command line flags uh, when you go to run the, the different automation. Now, uh, likewise, flows are defined in YAML. Flow definition is really simple. It's just steps with numbered slots. And uh, flows can call other flows, or they can call a task. So in this case, to set up a dev org, we've got to run the dependencies flow, run the deploy unmanaged flow, which will get kind of the, the source code for our project deployed, and then run the config underscore dev flow, 
which will configure our, our uh, environment for development use. And then finally call the task snapshot changes to reset the source tracking so that we can kind of track everything that we do from that point forward. Now, obviously every project is gonna have different needs for what it means to get a dev, a dev org or a QA org. And that's where Cumulus CI's project configuration comes in. So in the GitHub project repository, there's also a cumulusci.yaml file. That file gets parsed into a dictionary, and then we do a dictionary merge on top of Cumulus EI's global configuration. So the only thing that goes in the Cumulus EI.yaml file in a project is overrides and extensions of the global configuration. So you might have new custom tasks that you've written. You might have new custom flows that you've written. You might have dependencies that are unique to your project that you need to be able to define. Um, and what that might look like if, for instance, this is actually a sample from uh, the Nonprofit Success Pack uh, uh, repository that shows how um, NPSP is modifying the config dev flow, which as we saw just a minute ago, which as we saw just a minute ago, presenting from home, it's lovely, um, is uh, a flow that runs in step three of the dev org flow. So, this config dev flow in the global configuration of Cumulus CI normally just has um, a single, it normally just has two steps in it. So in this case, this project's adding three additional steps onto the end of the flow. So every dev org is gonna have these steps run against it automatically. So the project's overrides of the configuration of Cumulus CI's default configuration is really what we mean when we talk about the portable automation for Cumulus CI. It's all the automation needs of the project defined in the abstract. And then on top of that, we build client applications like CCI, our command line interface for accessing running tasks, running flows, creating scratch orgs. And then also our web applications are clients of this framework. They're clients of the portable automation defined for each individual project. So MetaCI uses a project's portable automation defined in the Cumulus CI YAML file to go run flows to run builds triggered by GitHub uh, webhooks or manually by a user. MetaDeploy likewise is just running Cumulus CI tasks, but against a customer org where they've granted access through OAuth. And that allows us to really service all the potential users of this automation. So automation is not really something just for your Jenkins system. Uh, it's something that your developers need to run locally, your QA people need to run locally, your doc writers, your product managers, your implementation partners, and ultimately even your customers. So that's the, the, a, a general introduction to Cumulus CI. And I do want to take a, a quick minute just to call out some of the Python projects that we're using in Cumulus CI. You know, I, I, I thought a lot thinking about this session of, you know, how would I answer the question of why do we build Cumulus CI in Python? Um, and to be honest, there was definitely an aspect of personal bias in it. I uh, come from a Python background. It was something that I knew and it was easy to kind of get this project bootstrapped using it. But in addition to that, Cumulus CI uh, has, you know, leveraged a lot of what's amazing about Python in the Python community. So we use applications like Click for building CCI, the command line interface. We're using Faker for test data generation. We're using GitHub 3.py for interacting with the GitHub API. We're using Jinja 2 for templatized configuration files. The request framework obviously gets uh, lots of heavy use as we're making a lot of different API calls. Um, we're using robot framework and the robot framework Selenium library to build a really rich uh, Selenium testing framework uh, for uh, cell, for uh, Salesforce development projects. We have a, a, an additional library that we built for robot framework that provides a bunch of keywords for driving the, uh, the UI and interacting with the APIs of a Salesforce instance. There's also the Salesforce bulk um, uh, library that interacts with the Salesforce bulk API for querying, inserting, updating, and deleting records. We're using Sarge for subprocess callouts. We're using simple Salesforce for uh, interaction with the Salesforce REST API and SQL Alchemy for our um, uh, functionality that uh, can capture and load data sets to and from a Salesforce org. Now, giving back to uh, that whole community, uh, I want to kind of briefly introduce one of our new, our newest open source tool, which is called Snowfakery. And unlike all the other stuff that we're talking or that we've been talking about. Snowfakery is a tool that you can use immediately. 
And you don't have to be using Salesforce at all in order to use Snowfakery. Snowfakery is a declarative framework for fake relational data generation. And it's capable of, uh, it, it has plugins to Faker. You can write all sorts of custom routines in it, randomize data and stuff like that. You can use it to generate small data sets. You can have a description of a data set shape and then say, give me a million of those records. Um, so you can generate large volumes of data and it just writes into a relational database because behind in the back end, it's using SQL Alchemy. So it should work with anything that SQL Alchemy works with. We have tested it internally with SQLite and PostgreSQL. Now, if you are using Cumulus CI and doing a Salesforce development project, Snowfakery plugs in with Cumulus CI's bulk API tasks to be able to populate Salesforce orgs with the data that's generated from these uh, definition files. That sounds interesting to you. Definitely go check out the repository, SFDO tooling, Snowfakery. There's great documentation and really great examples in there that kind of show all of the, the power of this framework. Now, let's uh, jump into our demos. This is uh, the part that I'm most excited about, getting hands-on with this tooling and showing you what you can do. All right, so for our first demo, we're going to show how to start a Salesforce development project using Cumulus CI. Now, why would you want to do this as a Python developer? Um, kind of two reasons. First, it's pretty cool that we built all of this stuff using Python. Um, but say you're a Python web application developer and you build a web application that collects in information from your users. And your users might be organizations or companies that might use Salesforce as their CRM system. And you start getting requests to integrate data from your application with Salesforce. Well, if you're going to integrate data from your application, probably there's some specific schema to that application. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about schema here. And if you want to integrate that data with Salesforce, you're going to need to create the schema in Salesforce. So these first two parts are really good. These first two demos are going to show you how you would go about creating schema, packaging it up, and making it available for your customers to install into their Salesforce instance so that you can get the plumbing in place for your integration. And then in the third demo, we'll take a look at actually building an integration like that as an example. So for this first um, demo, we're going to get a project started just to show you what it's like to do uh, development with Cumulus CI. And I'm going to go ahead and jump over to Visual Studio Code. Now, I already have uh, CCI, the command line interface for Cumulus CI, installed here. I've got a couple of other tools set up and configured, um, SFDX in particular, which is the Salesforce CLI. In our uh, Cumulus CI trailhead trail, the second module walks through all the setup instructions for this if you want to actually do this on your own computer. So the first thing that I'm going to do is make a directory called uh, PyCon demo. I'm going to change into that directory. And then I'm going to initialize it as a Git repository. Cumulus CI is designed to work inside of Git repositories. And then I'm going to run this command, CCI project init, which is going to initialize my project. I've got to provide it some basic values here, um, the name of the project, um, the package name, which is what the package will look like in, or in a Salesforce org. I'm going to go ahead and say that I want to make a managed package out of this project. Um, managed packages in Salesforce have a globally unique namespace assigned to them. Anybody can create a Salesforce developer edition org and go reserve one of those namespaces. And that's your namespace. That, that org becomes essentially the packaging org where you can upload packaged versions of whatever customizations that you've built. And I will use the latest Salesforce API version. I'm going to use, uh, we have two different source format options. I'll use SFDX source format, which is the newer source format. It's a little bit more friendly to work with. And uh, in this case, we're, we're building a standalone project. But I mentioned earlier that Cumulus CI and projects can define dependencies. So say you wanted to build something on top of NPSP or EDA, our open source projects for education and nonprofit. You could just say yes here, and then uh, it would give you a menu of options where you could uh, tell it, I want NPSP installed in all of my environments automatically. Um, it's pretty easy to do in the Python world with pip. Um, it's a lot more challenging to do in the Salesforce world and kind of one of the unique features that Cumulus CI helps solve for. Then I'm going to accept the default branch and uh, tag naming conventions for the project. And when I'm done, 
Let me go ahead and just add this project to my workspace here. All right. So I've got this project added to my workspace and it's created a whole bunch of skeleton for me. And it, the first thing that we wanna look at is the Cumulus CI YAML. You can see it's only 20 lines of code or of uh, configuration because it's inheriting all of the configuration from Cumulus CI's global config. So um, all of the tasks that are available in Cumulus CI's global config, um, I'm gonna type the command right, CCI task list, on the command line, we'll list off all the different tasks that are available. You can see there's a ton of them <laughs> uh, grouped by interactions with GitHub, data operations, interactions with Salesforce DX, a bunch of Salesforce specific automation, um, integration with packaging and things like that. There's, there's a ton in that list that's already available. And then also I have all of my flows that, that come in the global configuration of Cumulus CI, like the dev org and the QA org flow. I can get information about the dev org flow by using CCI flow info dev. And this will show me the dependencies flow, but then also the tasks that are contained inside of that. So we're gonna install the dependencies and then um, deploy the package source code. You'll notice these are Jinja2 style, um, uh, Jinja2 expressions uh, for uh, creating conditional steps in a flow and then uh, run the config dev flow. Now the last thing that Cumulus CI has provided out of the box for me is a default setup for five different types of scratch orgs, configurations for different types of orgs that we find helpful throughout the development process. These are lazy configurations, so they're grayed out because they haven't been woken up. You have to run something against them in order to wake them. So let's go ahead and run something against them. We'll run the uh, dev org flow against the org configuration named dev. And this will kick off and basically when this is done, uh, I will have a fully configured development environment for my project. Now this command, CCI flow run dev org minus minus org dev is the exact same command that you run in any Cumulus CI project to get a dev org. It's the project's job to extend and, and override anything that it needs to in the Cumulus CI YAML to make that into a usable development environment. Um, but it makes it really easy for users working across multiple different projects uh, to have that consistency. So you only have to remember a handful of commands really to, be, uh, to use most of the power of Cumulus CI. So you'll see in the start here that it, uh, it called out to Salesforce DX force org create and passed it a uh, configuration file, this orgs dev.json file. This is the scratch org definition file that defines the org shape that we want it to generate. So I want a developer edition org of, or a, a, a developer edition Salesforce instance. I want these different settings enabled in the org by default. And let me close that file. It looks like that flow has now completed. If I scroll down to the bottom now, I can jump into that org with running CCI org browser. And this will go open up that Salesforce instance that was just created for me on the fly. Now all of this, this is available to you free of charge. You don't have to pay any licenses to be able to use this if you wanna get in and, and kind of play around and um, uh, try some development on top of Salesforce. Um, now, before we jump in and actually build some things there, I wanna show one other thing real quick because I mentioned that we've built this integration with, um, actually, hold on, that inline, all right. So um, we built this integration with Robot Framework and I wanna show briefly what one of these tests look like. When we initialize a Cumulus CI project at first, we build your first regression test uh, case, which is testing to make sure that nothing you do breaks the ability to create a contact, which is kind of core in Salesforce. And so um, if you've seen Robot before, uh, you'll recognize some of this. If you haven't, it's a pretty simple um, keyword driven test uh, or testing framework uh, based in Python. Robot keywords are effectively just a Python method behind the scenes. Um, and in the settings section, we load in some resource libraries that come from Cumulus CI. This salesforce.robot uh, resource is actually pulling in our library of keywords for driving the browser through uh, the Salesforce UI. 
This via the API test is using Faker to generate some fake first and last names, using our Salesforce insert keyword and Salesforce get keyword to go create and then query a contact. And then it's using a custom defined keyword here in this test, test case later in the file to validate the contact. Now it gets more fun when you get into the Selenium side when you do it via the UI. You uh, use our page object keywords, go to page, home for the object contact, click the object button new, wait for the new contact modal to pop up, uh, and then populate the form using the form labels that are appear there, first and last name, using our fake first and last name above, hit save, et cetera, et cetera. And then on validate contact, we wanna go validate in the UI and in the API. So I can run this whole suite of tests uh, that got created for me automatically uh, by using the, or running the task named robot in Cumulus CI. This will run all the .robot fi uh, files under your test directory in the, in the project. So this should open up a new browser. And remember the first test is gonna go through the API. So what it's doing here is it's already created the contact through the API. And now it's going to, it came up in the old UI for some reason. <laughs> so it's uh, created the contact in uh, through the API and now it should um, go and oh, that test failed. All right, something to look at. So, um, but that gives you a, a general idea of uh, the kind of ability that we built in to be able to build browser tests on the Salesforce side of the, of the work that you're doing there, uh, which is really, really handy to have those automated test suites. Now, um, I'm gonna go ahead back into that scratch org here. Switch over to Lightning Experience, the new UI. And in setup, I wanna go start creating the schema. And the use case that we wanna go through here is uh, for a food bank to be able to track deliveries. So I'm gonna create a custom object or a table or a model um, in, in systems you might be familiar with working with. And I'm gonna create an object called delivery, select some options. I wanna be able to do reports and activities on it. I wanna launch a new custom tab wizard. Tabs are the, the tabs up at the top in the Salesforce interface, and they generally relate to an individual model. Um, and inside that tab, you can work with the records of that model. So to do this, I've got to select an icon for it. I'll pick the truck icon because it's for deliveries. And there's a bunch of configuration I can do here. I can pick what um, profiles this uh, tab is visible and what applications, which are just a grouping of tabs mostly. Um, you can come in and, and configure this, but for the sake of demo, I'm just going to kind of go through and accept a lot of the defaults here. Now, I've just created a new object called delivery. That delivery object has a few kind of auditing related uh, uh, fields automatically on it. And now I wanna go ahead and add a, um, oh, actually, yeah. I wanna go ahead and add a couple of fields here. The first field that I'm gonna add is a pick list field. And uh, we wanna track the status of the delivery I can enter in values here. So scheduled, uh, delivered, and canceled. All right. Save. Then let's add in one more here as a lookup to the account object in Salesforce, which is one of the standard objects in Salesforce to use for tracking a company or an organization. And I want to call this supplier. Again, lots of configuration you can do in each of these different fields, but we're just going to try to create something quickly here. And in addition to the deliveries, I really want to get more value out of this by tracking the individual items in a delivery. So let's say uh, create an item called delivery item and give it a plural name of delivery items. Go ahead and uh, change this to an auto number field. Give it a format for the auto number. 
We do want to allow reports. Let's skip over activities on this one. And we're not going to create a custom tab for this because we want this to be kind of a related record of the delivery itself. All right. So then in the fields relationship or fields and relationships, let's just create two, um, a long text area for description of the item. And then we also need to build the relationship. And in this case, we'll do a master detail relationship. That's uh, the equivalent of like a foreign key field. It's a required relationship. Um, and we want a master detail relationship to the delivery. So no delivery items can exist without a delivery that brought them. Um, except the defaults there. Next, next, and save. All right, so we've created these two objects really quickly, just kind of clicks not code uh, in the Salesforce instance. Now let's jump back into Cumulus CI and show how we capture that into version control. So go ahead and collapse that down. Um, close this robot test. There's a little bit more room on the command line here. And to do this, we're gonna use a task in Cumulus CI called list underscore changes. And actually, before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and, so that I don't have to keep typing minus minus org dev on the end of every command that I run, I'm gonna make the dev org into my default org for this project. So now I can just run list underscore changes. And this will go out and query the org and interact with the source tracking that's in the org to find all the metadata that I changed in the org. Now, sometimes you wanna exclude down the list and that's where the custom task options for this come in. Um, if I wanna find those options, I can do CCI task info list underscore changes. This will give me output of all the different task options. In this case, I want this exclude option to exclude components from the list. Um, and this is just a regex format. And I wanna leave out those profiles because profiles are kind of uniquely difficult to package uh, in the Salesforce world. They're more kind of a, an individual implementation configuration detail. So I do wanna capture the objects and the fields and the layouts uh, for those objects. So now all I've gotta do is just recall this command and change to use, rather than list changes, the retrieve changes task which accepts the same options. So you can kind of prepare the list of options. And this will go and actually run a query through the Salesforce metadata API and pull down the content uh, that was created. All right, so if I look now in my project under this force app directory, main default is where my metadata source lives. Under objects, I have folders for each of my objects, a folder for fields, the individual fields in them. So pretty cool. I was able to make these changes just in the web interface, capture those changes down to something that I can put in version control really easily. Now, let me just go ahead and uh, do a git add. I said uh, earlier on the demo intro slide that we were gonna create a feature branch. I forgot to do a commit on the master branch. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and commit this as the initial commit. and do this on the master branch and create the master branch for our project. So that's it. We've kind of started a project. We can now develop this Salesforce development project through feature branches. If I run um, the CCI org scratch delete dev command, it's gonna go wipe out that org where I created those changes. And now if I run the dev org flow again, it'll go create a new scratch org, run all the automation, and this time it's gonna deploy everything I just captured into that org. So I can iteratively develop and build out the solution. Pretty cool. All right, so for the next demo, I wanna show you the uh, web-based tools that we built on top of Cumulus CI to um, you know, make this a little bit more scalable and also a lot more approachable uh, to non-developer types uh, that are uh, kind of thrown off when you try to drop them into the command line. So um, we're, we're gonna take a look at Mateco in order to author a new feature to this application. Then we're gonna look at MetaCI, our build system, to, as it builds that feature. And then we'll look at MetaDeploy and how we would configure a new version that we're gonna create uh, for our web-based installer of this project. So 
let's go ahead and jump into now uh, this uh, project that I've got already out on GitHub, uh, I've already got connected to all of these tools. So we're going to switch over and use this for the rest of the demo. Um, but it's basically the same thing. You can see under the force app main default directory, I've got objects, I've got a delivery and a delivery item. Um, I think these have some, some additional fields on them. So they have a scheduled date and a notes field uh, that's on them. But what we want to do for this demo is since in the third demo, we're going to integrate a Django app to sync its data with this one. We want to actually add a new field that's uh, going to store the external ID from the Django app uh, as an external ID on this object. Um, so to do that, we could do that using CCI on the command line, uh, just like we were going through. But I want to show you our, our, our newest tool that's in the works, Mateco, which I think is really, really exciting. Um, so let me quickly log out of here just to uh, show you what it looks like from the start. When I come to Mateco, all that I have to have and I really know about GitHub to use Mateco is I've got to have a GitHub account, uh, which is pretty easy to create. So um, I come out and I log in and I've already accepted this app. Normally I would get the, do you want to grant this app access to your GitHub profile um, OAuth verification step. And what it does is it looks at the list of repositories that I have uh, contributor rights to and uh, compares that against the repositories that are configured in this instance. So you can kind of pick and choose what repositories this instance is supporting uh, contributions to. And in this case, I've got the CCI Food Bank repository uh, here, and I also have contributor rights. So I'm showing the card for that app. If I click here to go into the uh, app, I can, there's an existing project uh, that I created earlier, but in this case, we want to create a new project for our contribution. Um, and the external app is this app called DJ Food Bank uh, that we're going to look at in the third demo. So this is really to prepare that. Um, And we're going to create a task to create external ID fields for delivery and delivery item. And if I come in and look at this individual task, now this is kind of my workspace for the task. I've got to assign somebody as a developer. Right now, I'm the only uh, active member of this project. And so I'm going to go ahead and click Create Org. Now, this is doing essentially the same thing that the CCI flow run dev org minus minus org dev is doing on the command line. So it's tapping into that portable automation, just providing a totally different user experience that's a lot more friendly um, for people that are not comfortable in the command line. I started out my career as a Unix admin, so command line is kind of my bread and butter. Um, but um, you know, for a lot of people in the Salesforce world, they're very used to these kind of clickable web interfaces. And we really want to open up these projects to them to be able to contribute. And I will also go ahead and assign myself as the tester on this project, um, just so you can see what that looks like. And the general idea is the developer develops things in their scratch org, captures them, creates commits. The tester then creates a new scratch org using the automation from that branch to deploy into the org. And you can see my org's been created. So I'm going to go ahead and click View Org to log into the Salesforce org, the Scratch org that's been created for me. And in here, oh, it's really liking to launch those in <laughs> the classic UI for some reason. Um, so I'm going to switch over to the new UI because this is much, much nicer. Um, and in here, I want to add uh, two new fields. One on the delivery object, go to fields and relationships, go to new. And in this case, I want to add a number field for the integer ID of the um, app in Django. And let's call this DJ uh, Food Bank ID. And we're going to tell it that we want this to be an external ID. So that'll ensure uniqueness on uh, this field so that it can be used essentially as an index. And next. And save. And I also want this similar field on my uh, delivery item. So go to fields and relationship for delivery item. I'm going to go through and do this quickly. 
Feel free to pause the video and slow down if you want to see uh, any of this in more detail of what's happening. Um, okay, we're going to call this DJ Food Bank ID and um, also make this an external ID. And hit save. Cool, so I made the declarative changes. Now, just like we used the list changes uh, step on the on uh, CCI on the command line before, this time we're gonna use uh, Mateco, which kind of leverages that same automation from Cumulus CI to go out and query the org. Then it's gonna ask me, where do I wanna store this? Do I wanna store it in the kind of post install QA configuration that's sort of an optional configuration or do I want it in the main package directory? In this case, I want this in the main package because I want it to, to be something that when people install it, they, they get. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit next. And it's again gonna show me all the different metadata that it detected has changed in the orgs. We're gonna leave out the profiles, but we are gonna select the fields and the layouts. I'll hit next and um, All right, give it a commit message and tell it to go retrieve the selected changes. So notice I haven't really had to know anything about GitHub here. Behind the scenes, what it's done is created a, a feature branch for the project and then what we call a, a child feature branch. So the, the project is a parent feature branch. It's feature forward slash the parent project name. And this new branch that's been created for me now that this commit is on, Let's jump over and look at that in GitHub. Um, all right, if I look at this commit, this branch name is feature forward slash sync with DJ or DJ food bank underscore underscore, which separates the parent from the child feature branch. Add external ID fields to delivery and delivery item. A little bit long as a branch name, <laughs> but um, you can see here that it's just some, some, you know, it's pulled down just the changes that I made in the org, these two custom fields, and then adding those fields into the page layout XML definition uh, for it. So that looks good. Um, now, I wanna go ahead and pass this over to the tester because I think I've captured everything that I need. So I'm gonna do submit task for testing and uh, go ahead and Actually, I'll, I'll, I'll do this later on the project. So I'll go ahead and just submit the task, but I can in input information that will make its way into the pull request body. And this is gonna go submit a pull request for me. Now I can jump over into GitHub easily and look at that pull request that's been created. And you'll notice that there's builds that have already kicked off on this pull request that I created. Now, before we take a look at those builds, let me first, as the tester now, go and create a new org this is gonna create a new scratch org and deploy this new commit into the org so that I can go in and test in a clean environment. You don't wanna test in the development org, right? Um, and so let's jump over and take a quick look at MetaCI and what MetaCI is doing for me here. So this is MetaCI running out on Heroku and uh, it's run the feature test plan for this repository against my uh, child feature branch on this commit. And it's reusing Cumulus EI's portable automation again. So it's downloading the commit, it's calling Salesforce DX to create a new scratch org, and then it's running this flow CI underscore feature that I mentioned earlier as one of the built-in flows for doing feature branch testing. And if I go to the flows tab, you'll notice the output here looks identical to what we get if we run CCI on the command line. So we're running this automation in a different way with a different user experience around it, but ultimately it's running the same automation in the same way. If this, if this flow failed and I wanted to debug it, I could run it uh, using CCI locally with a minus minus debug flag, and it would drop into a PDB prompt whenever uh, the, the flow fails. And also because this is a Salesforce specific system, I get some information about the target environment uh, that it was built that's kind of specific to Salesforce. Now, in addition to that, it's kicked off and is running my robot tests as well for me. Um, and since that one's still running, I'll show you what one of these looks like. I think this is a really cool feature. Um, because this is a system for building Cumulus CI projects and we, we, we use robot for uh, the projects, I can go in and see, we, we built an integration with robot framework into this. So if I wanna see the test via the UI, if you've ever worked with robot framework before, you've seen this uh, log format, we actually integrate those directly into the browser. 
So I can see exactly what's going on. It'll even capture a screenshot if there's a, a missing locator or a locator that doesn't find uh, the right thing on its end. All right, so all checks have passed. Everything looks good here. Let's go back in here and as the tester, I'll go log into the test environment just to show you that this environment's been created and I can log into it. Um, now, normally in a non-demo sense, I would go through and actually do testing in this environment. Let's go ahead and jump ahead and submit the review, say approve, and it looks great. Submit review. Now if I go over on uh, the pull request, that shows up as a comment that was left by me. And also it shows up as a commit status. So you can set up protected branches to require that as a, as a check before it's allowed to merge. I'm gonna go ahead and merge this pull request. And notice this pull request was just to merge into the parent feature branch. So now this task is done. If I go back to the project level, I can submit the project for merge. And here I'll go ahead and provide some release notes. Um, All right, so now that's created a, a, another pull request for me. And this pull request is requesting to merge this branch into master. Again, normally, uh, and we do have protected branches set up on this one, I normally don't have it where admins can override, but for the sake of demo, I would wait for these builds to complete before I do this normally. But in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and use my admin rights and merge this pull request into master so that we can kind of continue along to the next steps in MetaCI. All right, so jumping back into MetaCI, our build system, you'll see that that merge to master has queued up a build on the upload beta um, branch. Now, the way that the triggering is set up is through plans, which are, if you're familiar with Jenkins, these are like jobs in, in Jenkins. Except unlike Jobs and Jenkins, plans are really simple and they can apply to multiple different repositories because of their simplicity, because Cumulus CI creates this kind of common interface uh, across projects. So for instance, the upload beta uh, flow, uh, its role is to create a beta release. It's triggered off of commits using a regex match of master. Um, there's three repositories that are using this basic configuration. It runs against an org named Packaging and it runs two flows, CI master, that will deploy the code into my packaging org, and then release beta that will upload a, a release of that and create the release in GitHub. So let's uh, check back here. So this system will actually auto scale your uh, Heroku worker dynos. So it monitors the build queue in Redis and uh, automatically will scale up to a certain limit uh, that you can set in config vars on the Heroku app. So it's, it's, it's dynamically creating worker dynos and then when the queue goes back to zero, it's scaling everything back down to zero and shutting them all down. Um, you can also set up reserve capacity to keep one or two on at all times. But the nice thing is Heroku is only billing you down to the second for uh, your usage. All right, so those have kicked off and started running. And if I look at the flows, um, you can see, again, this is just like the command line inner, or output that I would see if I were running this from the command line uh, CCI. And it is almost done with its deployment to the packaging org. And then it's gonna run the release beta flow in order to cut a, um, a release of the package. Now, while that's running, I'm gonna go ahead and queue up a new production release build. Um, and so, again, normally I would wait for the beta build to complete and the beta testing to pass, but we're just gonna kinda of speed things along for the purpose of the demo. So I went through and I picked the uh, upload release plan on the CCI Food Bank repository and am running this against the master branch. I hit submit. And you'll notice that this is actually waiting on the other build to complete. So one of the challenges that we ran into, because we don't work in virtual machines, you know, the, a lot of cloud-based CI systems presume that um, if you need more concurrency, they'll just give you more virtual machines. That doesn't really work for us because our build environment 
uh, for these these packet or for the packaging, we have a single packaging org uh, where the package gets uploaded. So um, it should go and unlock here in a minute, but I can go ahead and force it. Um, go ahead and unlock that org. And one of the other things that you'll notice is at the end of this upload beta build, um, just to show you what we do in release automation, it uploads a new version of the package, which is what it's doing here. Then we create a release in GitHub. We generate release notes automatically by parsing the pull request bodies and put those in the release. And then at the end, we run this uh, task called GitHub master to feature that takes this new tested commit in master and merges it into all open feature branches. So that's actually triggered all these other feature branches to build because they now have new code integrated into them automatically. Um, all right. Let me just kick off a rebuild on this and try to speed it along. There we go. So now this upload release build is running and it is deploying into the packaging org, but this time rather than a beta version of the package, it's gonna create a production release of the package. Now over in the GitHub repository, this has created under uh, releases, um, a beta release of the package here. And here's the release notes that I entered and a link back to the pull request where those release notes came from. So our release notes generator finds all the PRs that have been merged to master since the last release tag and concatenates together the release notes based on the contents of the pull request body, which we include as part of our code review of uh, new features. And here in a minute, whenever that build's done, there we go, it completed. So now I've got the new version of this product, version 1.4. So now let's go over and talk about meta deploy. And uh, MetaDeploy, you can see our uh, production instance of this that's used by thousands of uh, nonprofit and education customers of ours, has all of our main products in it uh, available for installation. So for instance, if I wanted to install the NPSP or the Nonprofit Success Pack, I would come here. These are all the, each one of these steps is ultimately a task in Cumulus CI that it's available to run against an org that I connect it to. And then I just click a button and it goes through and runs all of this process for me automatically. Now, um, I have this project set up to our staging site. So, oh, I'm gonna deploy STG. And so I have a CCI food bank, and you can see here that right now this is set as version 1.3. Since I've created the new version, I need to actually publish that new version out to this site. So now we're gonna jump back into the command line and I'm gonna go into the uh, local clone of CCI food bank, pull down the latest master. And this time I'm going to run a task in Cumulus CI called meta deploy underscore publish. Um, and I need to give it a tag. This is release forward slash one or one dot four. And I'm also going to tell it to go ahead and publish the plan that it's going to create for installing this new version. So it goes out and it downloads the tag, parses the configuration of the tag. Now the configuration of the tag came from the Cumulus CI YAML. Um, show you what that looks like down to the bottom of the Cumulus CI YAML here for this project. I have plans, install, and notice that the steps for the install are just using flows and tasks. So it's just another configuration of the portable automation for the project. And uh, these plans can get a little bit involved, you know, calling a number of different tasks and everything, depending upon how complex the automation that you want to make available to end users is. In this case, we're just doing something really simple. And so that published it up. Now, if I go back to um, the homepage for MetaDeploy and go into CCI Food Bank, you'll see that I've got version 1.4. If I click here, it's going to install um, the I don't know why that says demo 1.5. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> Find something new in demos every day. So um, yeah, that's it. We made a change through the web, got it into the repository, 
merged the pull request, got new releases. You can see it's a pretty painless process that we put together when you have all of these web tools and Cumulus CI, the framework, kind of working in, in conjunction with each other. Um, really a pretty painless process for an open source project to be able to manage something as complex as building customizations on the Salesforce platform uh, and making those available to thousands of users. So let's now switch over and talk about integrating this whole thing with um, a Python web app. So for this third demo, I built a sample Django application that um, uh, helps food banks track deliveries and delivery items, a uh, very common uh, scenario that, that we just went through in the first two. Um, and I have gone ahead and, and done the integration. What we'll do is walk through and I'll show you how I built the integration for that Django app and leverage some of uh, Cumulus CI in that Django app to help my users be able to configure uh, the application, and then we'll go through and show how the integration is actually working. All right, so let's jump back into VS Code. We'll start talking about this from a code perspective, or actually, you know what? Take that back. We're gonna go in the browser. We're gonna take a look at this application. So go ahead and sign out of this application and come back and sign in. I've created a user for myself in this application. Um, this is just using the PyDanny cookie cutter template for uh, Cumulus or for uh, Django um, and running on Django 3. Um, helps to input my password correctly. And now it's gonna log me in and take me to my account. Um, and so we'll, we'll come back to the my account page here in a minute. But I just wanna show you how deliveries work. Um, so I have a basic structure for deliveries I can have uh, fields on the individual deliveries. I can create additional delivery items. So say this is potatoes. All right, and I've got my different items uh, created. And so, you know, anybody could use this. They don't have to be Salesforce users or whatever. But if you built an app like this for food banks, you're probably gonna wind up starting getting requests from different food banks, because there's a lot of food banks that are actually using Salesforce for their backend systems. So uh, you might get the question of like, how do I get this data into my Salesforce instance? It would really allow me to kind of report on it, to tie it in with all of my other uh, records and track a lot of this stuff a lot better. So that's what we're gonna go through, or that's what I'm gonna go through and show you now is how I built the integration of this application to be able to talk to a Salesforce instance. So the first part of that is you've got to allow your users to be able to connect to Salesforce instances. Um, and we're uh, doing this using some uh, open source uh, Python code that we've written on, in um, a package that's called SFDO template helpers. It's not up on PyPy, but it is out in a public GitHub repository, which is how we've installed it in this one. Um, and SFDO template helpers has a functionality that extends the uh, all -auth, uh, uh, OAuth configuration for um, being able to interact with some of the unique aspects of doing OAuth in Salesforce. One of those unique aspects is the need for a couple of different separate buttons. Um, so if you wanna to connect to a production or developer edition Salesforce org, you'll notice when I click here, it takes me to login.salesforce.com. If I wanna to connect to a sandbox or a scratch org, when I click here, it's gonna take me to test.salesforce.com. So that's one of the main things that our um, uh, OAuth extension to all auth um, for Salesforce projects does is make it easy to, to kind of support both those different use cases uh, in a way that the, the default provider in all auth doesn't do. And um, then the other thing that it's doing is actually encrypting the tokens using Fernet um, uh, encryption uh, before it writes it into the database. So let's take a look at how we wired in the OAuth connection first. All right. And I've got this pulled up in my workspace. So just to show you how this is structured, I've got uh, under config settings, um, and then I've also got requirements. So for the base requirements, I just added in a link out to our GitHub repository, SFDO tooling, SFDO template helpers and uh, pegged it at a particular release version um, of 
that uh, helper repository. So then when I you know, pip install off of this file, I get that installed into my local environment. And then in the configuration, there's a few things that I've added to my kind of default configuration file here. Um, I set a, a default uh, database just to use a, a same default for the database name here for local development. Then all, oh, and then I've also added in some, find my third party, here we go. I've added in, uh, I had a deliveries app originally, created another app inside of here called SF integration um, that has all the logic for the Salesforce integration. We'll look at, at, at that code uh, here in a minute, but I wanna kind of focus on the, the OAuth side for now. And uh, then at the bottom, I've had to create a Salesforce connected app. And uh, I'll show you in a second here what that looks like. They're really easy to create inside of a developer edition org or any other persistent Salesforce org. Um, but this is just the, the application, like if you create a, a GitHub app to, to build OAuth integration with GitHub, uh, same thing. We're using environment variables so that we can run this out on Heroku and set these um, through configuration on the app. We're also using uh, or, you know, environment variables to get the encryption key uh, that we use for database encryption. You'll need a GitHub personal access token uh, to do interaction with the GitHub API on behalf of the app. So we get that from an environment variable. And then here we're just wiring in the SFDO template helper uh, account adapters and account providers and setting the appropriate scope for this individual application and wiring in the connected app details to get those from the environment instead of storing them in the database itself. So um, let's take a look at the connected app there for this. Mm. Let's go log in again. And so this is a Salesforce developer edition org that I created. So it's a persistent org, um, which is good for doing things like, um, if I wanna get into the app manager. And the app manager, I can come in and create a new connected object. Um, you just give it a name, an API name, a contact email, say to enable the OAuth settings, give it a, a callback. And in this case, I want both full and refresh token access to be able to get a refresh token. Unlike some OAuth providers, um, the, the access token is not a persistent token. It will expire and you need the refresh token to be able to recreate it. Um, so having that access is important for an app like this. And uh, in this case, I've already created one of these. So uh, that's the one that I'm using in my app, um, just to show you what that looks like when it's fully created is you get the consumer key or the client ID uh, here. You can click here to reveal the secret and then the callback URL for the application. One of the things that's nice about these in Salesforce is uh, if it's localhost, you can use HTTP, otherwise HTTPS is required, uh, but that's really nice for building a connected app for your development, uh, local development environments. All right, so with that, I basically have Django all off handling my OAuth login to Salesforce for me. Um, and one thing that I'm gonna to wanna to do is let's go ahead and create a new um, scratch org here. So let me just wake up the QA org config. And this will create a new scratch org that we can connect to the app and kind of show how that's gonna work. So we looked at the, the requirements to add in that project, the changes that we made in the configuration. And then the next thing that we'll look at is the changes that we made in the actual uh, Django application code in order to make that possible. But first, let's go ahead and get this org connected up. So I'm gonna go back to my application and I wanna connect a new sandbox or scratch org. And I can go get from the output of CCI org info, the username and password for this scratch org that it created for me to log into it.
Hmm. Okay. Try that again. I don't know why that's not working. <laughs> of course, I'm doing a demo. Um, all right. Just try, maybe it's that carrot character. Um, Have it regenerate that password for me real quick. Hmm. All right, well, we'll just go ahead and use the existing connection that I've got uh, for this that is out to another um, Salesforce org, uh, or another Scratch org that I created earlier. Um, and just try recreating that scratch order real quick. Try one more time and see if we can get this to work. If not, we'll just reuse that existing org that I've already connected. But just to show you, I want to be able to show you the whole process of uh, connecting an org up. All right, it's created my org and it's setting a password for it. Let's see if we can get this to work now. One of the nice things about scratch orgs, it's easy to start from scratch uh, <laughs> when something goes wrong. That looks a lot better. Okay, so now it's gonna ask me to grant access. Uh, the name here is the name that you set in your connected app. And so I'm gonna go ahead and do allow. Now, one thing that I didn't do in my demo project is have this redirect back to a page that's more friendly than this one. So I'm gonna go back to this account page. And you'll notice that for this org, the last install status uh, is empty and it's showing me install configuration. So what I need to do is actually install the new version of that package that I just created into my Salesforce org. And I can do that by just clicking install here. Now in this demo, I have this just kind of running directly in the web uh, process. Um, in production, you would wanna use some queuing mechanism. We use uh, Django RQ or something like Celery. Uh, to run this in a background worker process. But I'll show you what this looks like in the dev server uh, that's running in the background. You can see that um, it has actually kicked off, a little bit hard to see here. What is that? Yeah. So it has kicked off and gone out. And, and what I've run here is the update dependencies task in Cumulus CI and just pointed it at the GitHub repository for this project. And it goes out and examines how Cumulus CI is configured in, the pro in their project. It looks at the latest releases in their repository. And then it finds uh, the latest release and goes through and installs that latest release for me automatically. So it looks like it's done now. So that package that we created, now just through this web app, I've managed to install into the Salesforce org that I, as a user of the app, just connected to using my permissions in that org. So now let's go create a delivery. Um, and let's say the supplier of this is a local farm. Um, I'll skip doing a scheduled date for now, but let's say from a notes perspective, um, follow up um, next month to set a scheduled date. And I have the option, I've added the option here where I can pick 
which Salesforce instance do I want to integrate this particular delivery? So I might have a test environment, uh, you know, a couple of different test environments, and then my production environment. This would allow me to pick which one of those. And this here that is showing me is the Salesforce username that I use to log into that Salesforce instance. So I'm going to pick this second one here, which is the new org that I just connected, and hit save. Of course. <laughs> oh, okay. Quick code correction here. This is a good opportunity to go in and look at the code for the integration uh, anyhow. So um, on the integration, I've got a model here, uh, or I've got two models, a delivery model and a delivery item model that have the, or the appropriate objects. I've overridden the save method here, um, supporting a custom keyword for SF sync that can be set to false. If it's not set to false, then it's gonna call this sync delivery um, job that I have specified over here in this jobs file. And the sync delivery job is going to receive a delivery ID and whether it's been created or not, it's going to go try to look up that delivery um, by the ID. If there's not a Salesforce user on that delivery, it just exits out because we, there's, no, there's no Salesforce to sync it to. And then I built this utility method, get simple Salesforce connection, that's going to initialize an instance of simple Salesforce using the credentials from all auth from the all auth connection to Salesforce. Then we'll run a query in Salesforce for the supplier by name. And uh, this query is a format called Sockle. It's very similar to SQL, but this is how you can query data inside of a Salesforce instance. SF in this case is the instance of simple Salesforce. So sf.query allows me to run a query. I get back a result set. A result set. It has keys for total size and records. And uh, it looks like the error was coming from line 23. This is a dictionary. I had tested the other path of updating uh, earlier before this demo, but um, you know, relatively easy uh, change to make there. And uh, it's either going to retrieve or get an existing account from my Salesforce instance with that name, or it's gonna create a new account. And then this is how in simple Salesforce, you create an instance of a record. You give it the object name, which is kind of a virtual class uh, that gets created on the fly through simple Salesforce. Call the create method on it. You pass it a dictionary of the values. Um, and then I'm getting the Salesforce ID of what was synced and saving it on this individual record. Let me go back and rerun that save here. Cool. So I've now got my object created and I've got a link here to go over and view that in Salesforce. If I click view, this is gonna take me over into uh, Salesforce where I can see that record in the schema that we've created over on the Salesforce side. So I can see it's linked out to a uh, supplier, a local farm. Under related, I can see it doesn't have any delivery items right now. Um, so uh, I actually have to pause this video and come back because I've got a meeting I've got to jump into, but uh, have time after this uh, that I will finish up the rest of the session and splice it in. So be back in just a sec. All right, so we're gonna uh, pick up where we left off uh, in walking through this uh, Django app that we've now got integrated with Salesforce. And uh, we just walked through uh, the integration of the deliveries um, and let's go ahead and check the delivery items. So let's go ahead and create um, some delivery items. Let's say we've got carrots, um, save that. We've got some frozen peas and those need to be stored as frozen. And we've got some potatoes. By the fact that uh, I didn't get any errors in saving those, I'm presuming that those uh, uh, items actually synced over to Salesforce uh, as part of the save. So let's go over and look at that delivery record in Salesforce. Um, and this time we'll go to related and I can see those values are now entered into uh, the Salesforce app. Now, the thing that's cool about this is, um, you know, for this nonprofit organization, uh, they also now have this a, a local farm as a supplier. 
Now in our application, all that we had was just a name for who supplies uh, the delivery. But now that this is in Salesforce, they have full capability to maintain a list of contacts from that organization, um, different donation opportunities that they might be getting uh, value from that organization, have all the information about the organization. Um, and all of these are totally customizable by them so that they can build this constituent relationship management environment uh, to be what they need as an organization or as a, uh, you know, as an organization to be able to track their different suppliers, their relationships with their suppliers. They also have access to chatter so they can come in and have kind of a threaded feed of discussion related to this particular supplier. Um, so there's a lot of functionality that your application gains that you don't have to build into the application yourself. You just kind of need to get the data synchronized with Salesforce and you can use all of the open source tools that, that we built and, and written in Python uh, in order to be able to do that. Now, let's uh, dig into the code a little bit for uh, this integration so that we can kind of see what, it, what it's doing. Um, so we started walking through this jobs file that has the sync delivery uh, function inside of it. And we're querying for the uh, delivery based on ID. Then we're getting a simple Salesforce connection. Um, we'll take a look at that uh, function here in a minute. Um, but to just continue walking through this one, we're running a query against Salesforce to query for an account whose name is the supplier name on the delivery. Then uh, we're either creating a new account or using the uh, first record that we found with that name. And then if uh, created is true, so if this was a new record that was just created, we go ahead and create the record inside of uh, the Salesforce instance, get back the Salesforce ID of the record, which is how we're building that link uh, to link out to the record in Salesforce, and then saving that record and telling it, don't worry about syncing this to Salesforce because we're just updating the Salesforce ID. If uh, it was an update to the record, we do pretty much the same thing. In this case, we're gonna query for Salesforce for the record based on the ID uh, that we have in the Salesforce ID field. If we don't find anything though, it's possible that the, the record got deleted from Salesforce and you wanna recreate that record. So we're just gonna call sync delivery again, but this time tell it that we created it true. So it will just go ahead and create a new record. Otherwise, it's gonna call um, through simple Salesforce through our object um, and call the update method. Now, one thing you might notice here is this CCI FB1 underscore underscore. That is the namespace prefix that's applied to all um, schema that is inside of a managed package. So when you reserve a namespace in, in, in Salesforce that's globally unique for your managed package, um, all of your objects get this prefix kind of applied to them. Also, all the fields that you create get this prefix applied to them. That helps avoid collisions. So say you have a, you know, a, a common uh, field like salutation or something like that. Uh, it avoids multiple different packages uh, colliding with each other. And then for the delivery item synchronization, very similar process. We're gonna query for the delivery item, check to make sure that it's delivery has a Salesforce user, get an instance of the simple Salesforce API check to see or um, if it's created. So if it's a new record, then we're gonna go ahead and create it in Salesforce and record back the ID. And if it's an update to the record, then we will go ahead and query to make sure that that record still exists in Salesforce, if not recreate it. And if so, go ahead and update the record just with the description and the storage requirements field. So the integration is pretty easy. Um, once you have that connection formed to Salesforce, and once you have the schema installed into the package on the other end. So that's how we're actually syncing the data. What I wanna show you next is how we are, um, how this package is uh, handling getting the package installed for the user. Because I think this is where you're really tapping into a lot of the value of Cumulus CI as a framework. You're just tapping into Cumulus CI's portable automation uh, to be able to run an installation. So I've created a basic model here for the package install. Um, it's a social, or it has a link out to the uh, OAuth social account, which is your Salesforce uh, uh, OAuth connection. 
And then it has a status field um, with the statuses here. It has um, fields to track when it was queued, when it started, when it ended, and a field to track exceptions on it. Um, now you could expand this out in uh, MetaDeploy, for instance, we capture the full log into a field in the database so that it's easy to go see on an individual installation if something failed. Um, and we've wired this up into the Django admin panel. Let me show you what that looks like. If I come out here um, and go to package installs, I can actually see every one of the installs that's been run of my package so that you can go, you know, you could go out and uh, keep an eye on, hey, if, if your customers are starting to hit installation errors, maybe there's something you want to change in the automation and how it's working uh, to address those issues. And then um, we've got these, uh, a couple of utility functions that I built. Um, the first utility function is to escape single quotes. Uh, this is in SQL queries. Um, there's not support for parameterization uh, or parameterized queries over the uh, REST API. Um, but the biggest risk for injection, because uh, you can't use a semicolon uh, in order to uh, have another um, uh, query or another command afterwards. So the biggest risk here is a uh, single quote uh, being inside of the value. So we go ahead and escape that value in that case. Then uh, this simple function to take a social account and parse out the Salesforce credentials from it. And this is going to use uh, a decryption in order to uh, or a decryption uh, helper that's available through SFDO uh, template helpers. Um, and uh, that will go decrypt the values that are stored encrypted in the database, get you the token and the secret, and return back a quick dictionary. Now to build a simple Salesforce connection, you just pass it a social account and it does a couple of things. We, uh, this is kind of common code that we use um, for uh, modifying requests to automatically retry uh, calls in the API calls. Um, you go ahead and call get credentials that we just looked at in order to parse out the credentials from the social account. And then you just initialize an instance of simple Salesforce. You've got to pass it the instance URL of the Salesforce instance that's available in extra data and then the key instance URL. And it needs the token from the credentials. We're also going to tell it a Salesforce API version number. Uh, the API in Salesforce is versioned. Um, so you can still, you know, it, it, by specifying this as kind of a fixed value, you're sort of assured that you're going to be interacting with the same API even as Salesforce continues to update releases. Then uh, we're gonna set some, some headers on the call in order to handle authentication of the call and go ahead and uh, mount our adapter for retries onto the session and then return back that configured API instance. Now, the actual installation of that package. So just to go back and kind of set where this was in the UI, if I come back to my account, um, here, if I, if I click reinstall configuration, it's gonna call this, this section of code that we're looking at next. And this section of code is actually going to initialize an instance of the Cumulus CI runtime, and then uh, configure one of the default Cumulus CI tasks, update dependencies, and pass it an option to tell it, go install this other GitHub, or install the GitHub repository for your Cumulus CI project, the CCI food bank repository, go install that repository into this org. And so to do that, we've got to do a little bit of boilerplate kind of wiring uh, for things. Um, but that's going to be done in this method deploy repo. And here we need a social account of what's the target Salesforce environment that we want to run this against. Um, we need to know what we're storing, what class we're storing the result against. You could just pass a, a um, package install, but say there's other operations you want to do, this abstracts it out just a little bit. And so in this case, we're going to query the result class in order to go get the instance of the result object where we want to store kind of the status and the date updated or the, the date started and date ended uh, on the operation. And the next thing we're going to do is prepare in Cumulus CI an org configuration or org config. So we got to go get the social account. We're going to call get Salesforce credentials, the helper function that we looked at uh, in the utils file earlier, and get that credential. Then we're going to build an org config by passing it a dictionary of the, configure, of the relevant configuration that we need it to have. 
It needs an instance URL, an access token, and a refresh token. Then we're gonna give that org a name. And in this case, it's not a persistent keychain, so we're just gonna call that org connected uh, for going forward. The next thing that we need to do is prepare the OAuth uh, connected app service. Um, and uh, this is actually um, going to be uh, querying out to the social app from uh, the uh, provider in uh, all auth and getting the, the client ID and the client secret and configuring a service configuration for the Cumulus CI keychain for the connected app uh, that allows us to do uh, OAuth to GitHub or to uh, Salesforce. Then we also need to configure the, key, the GitHub service in the Cumulus CI keychain so that we can run automation against the GitHub API as part of this task that we're gonna run. To do that, we initialize another service configuration. In this case, we're just gonna have password as the configuration value and pass it the GitHub token from uh, settings. And in fact, this should get modified here. Uh, that was working because of old records in my database, but this should actually be connected app client ID, and this should be uh, settings connected app client secret. All right, save that. And uh, so we've got our org config created, stored as the variable org. We've got a connected app service config created, a GitHub service config created. Now we need to initialize the Cumulus CI runtime. So I built a, a slight extension of Cumulus CI's uh, runtime just to, to kind of take out some of the assumptions that are made in Cumulus CI, uh, that it's running inside of a Git project and everything, um, so that we don't have to download a GitHub repository. We just wanna be able to run this task as Python code. So we'll take a look at that uh, next. But for now, we're just initializing the Cumulus CI runtime as CCI. That's gonna have an attribute on it for the keychain. We're calling the set service method on the keychain to tell it here's the connected app service and here's the GitHub service. This last option here is whether you wanna set the service at a global level or at a per project level. So true sets it at a global level. Then we're gonna prepare a task configuration that has the options that we wanna pass into the update dependencies task. And uh, in this case, update dependencies accepts an option called dependencies. You pass it a dictionary, um, or you pass it a list of dictionaries for the dependencies. And if your dependency has a key GitHub, you can just point it at a GitHub repository URL. Um, and it will go out and examine that GitHub repository URL and write everything out for you. Or in, in uh, kind of handle installing that URL as a Cumulus CI project. So next we're gonna import from Cumulus CI tasks Salesforce, the update dependencies class. Then we're gonna initialize that class, passing it the project config from the runtime, the task configuration from here, and the org configuration that we created up above. So that's what's needed in order to in initialize any uh, instance of a Cumulus CI task. And then we're gonna go ahead and uh, these task classes, you basically build an instance and then uh, the instance itself is runnable. Um, so we're gonna run the task here and then we're gonna record or set the status field to success unless there's an exception, then we'll set the status to failed and record the exception as uh, uh, the exception field on the object. And in either scenario, we'll go ahead and set the date end and do result.save. So, the, a little bit of, uh, of, of code to kind of walk through, but I mean, really in you know 73 lines of code, you've managed to in automate the installation of a package. And, and really you could tap into doing a lot more automation here if you wanted to um, by leveraging all of the different automation that's available in Cumulus CI and any Cumulus CI task or flow. Um, now, the final thing to show you is in this CCI file, um, I've created a, an extension of the base Cumulus CI runtime. I've imported that from Cumulus CI core runtime. Uh, and all the, the only reason I created this extension was so that I can specify a different project class. Now a project assumes that it's gonna be running inside of a, a GitHub repo. So in this case, I wanna go ahead and uh, feed it the repo info as a dictionary. 
Um, and in, in this case, I also just went with a blank Cumulus AI configuration. The configuration that parses YAML is a subclass of base project config. Um, and uh, it called YAML project config that will actually parse the YAML file. But in this case, we don't have a repository that we're working with. We wanna kind of point it at a repository over the API. So I've just provided it the configuration that the project is gonna need in order to run what I need it to run. So it's gonna to need to know the API version that we wanna target. It's gonna to need to know uh, the description of the services that I wanna to connect to it. So the connected app service needs to have an attribute client ID and client secret. The GitHub uh, service needs to have a password attribute. And that's pretty much it. So not a whole lot of override of Cumulus CI, but something that's really easy to do uh, just in a, in a subclass. And with the combination of those things, the um, OAuth integration, this integration of Cumulus CI to be able to run a Cumulus CI task to kind of target automation at, uh, at, at your user's org. And uh, with the, um, the code in uh, deliveries, in this uh, job section to actually do the sync of data between those once that once the target org has already been configured. Um, really, you've got a, a pretty full scale integration. Um, now, just to emphasize again, all of this is actually using uh, the um, all of this integration is running in line in the process. You do not want to do that in production. These should be tossed into a background worker queue, handled asynchronously with retries and kind of error monitoring and things like that. Um, you'll want to do tweaks on the front end user experience for users so that you're showing them updates on the process as it's running and things like that. Um, but all of those things are kind of standard uh, uh, parts of building a Python web application. So you know you can apply your creativity and your approach to user experience on top of it. But Cumulus CI provides a lot of the, the plumbing that you would need in order to build this kind of an integration. So with that, we're through the demo portion of the session. Um, and uh, I'll leave you with just uh, some, some resources for additional information. Um, first and foremost, if you're interested in Cumulus CI, is going, uh, I really recommend going through the Trailhead Trail. Um, it will probably take you about a day, um, honestly, as a, as a uh, Python developer, maybe uh, less than that. Um, but that Cumulus AI trail will, will uh, allow you to do a lot of what we did in the first part of the demo, but also even more in showing you how to, how to sync data sets. And it will also walk through the process of uploading a, a managed package and even building another repository that's an extension of that project that has kind of customer specific implementation details. Also, the Cumulus CI documentation is available at cumulusci.readthedocs.io. Um, that is documentation we're in the process of reworking, but there's a lot of good reference material there about how we manage uh, data sets, about our integration with robot framework, um, and, and some individual features of, of Cumulus CI uh, that you can look into. And then finally, the three GitHub organizations uh, that are really great places to dig into. Uh, first is Salesforce Foundation, which is where all of our open source products live. So you can go find the repository for NPSP. If you really want to understand Cumulus CI um, and all the different things you can do with it, um, I highly recommend going to those open source repro uh, project repositories and looking at the CumulusCI.yaml files in them to see the way all the different types of automation that we've implemented for our projects using Cumulus CI. Um, SFDO tooling is my team's uh, GitHub organization. It's where all the, all the open source tools uh, that we talked about uh, live. You can go kind of see uh, the development process of all of that tooling uh, there. And then finally, SFDO community is the uh, GitHub organization for open source commons projects um, that are, are community driven and uh, uh, that we you know, help support and facilitate with all of this tooling. So, uh, thank you very much for uh, making it through this uh, rather lengthy uh, session with me. Um, I am super excited to get to share this uh, with the, the Python community. I'm incredibly grateful to the Python community for uh, everything that's been built that allows me, or that has allowed us to be able to, to create um, uh, this tooling that really is essential to everything that our team does and really helps us maximize the impact that we can create in the world. So 
Thank you.